Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of The Articulate Fly, and on this episode I'm joined by Nicole March of The Quilted Tire. How's it going, Nicole? Oh, good. <laughs> a little nervous. It's all good. Nothing to be nervous about. And before we start chatting tonight, I want to give a shout out to tonight's sponsor. It's This episode sponsored by the 20th Virginia Fly Fishing and Wine Festival. And this upcoming event will be held on January 11th and 12th in Doswell, Virginia. And if you go to their website, which is vaflyfishingfestival.org, or if you go to our event page, you can get all the information on the latest speakers, vendors, and classes. On to our interview. Well, Nicole, I always ask all of my guests to share their earliest fishing memory. Um, oh, boy. Um, oh, gee. Well, I used to fish with my dad all the time um, when I was younger. But when we were pretty young, me, my brother, and my sister, we would fish in Long Island. I don't, we, there was, we go for the weekend and we would just go fish. Some of them were canals. <laughs> And some of them were like the actual beaches, but you know, you you would cast out and we'd buy frozen squid at the bait shop and I would just sit there with my dad's knife and just <laughs> cut it apart. And, you know, we would cast out and you never knew what you were gonna catch. And, you know, is this poisonous? Does it have spikes? Does this have teeth? A lot of it was sea robins and they would come up and they would start uh <laughs> start barking. But yeah, my the earliest fishing I remember was with my dad in the ocean or in the sound, and we would take the boat out and get the nets, like the crab nets, and just lean over the side of the boat and just grab the crabs as they swam by. Um, oh, yeah, a lot of it was in the sound, and then we'd go back, back home, and then go back again for the weekend for the day and fish. But you know, you would take the boat out to, uh, you know, back. Things are different now than they were back then. Back then, you know, you'd go fishing with your, your dad, and you guys would go park the boat in the ocean out there in high tide and uh, leave it there. And then low tide would come out, and you'd be standing there in the middle of the banks. <laughs> you'd just, you know, you'd be standing there, a bunch of little kids, standing out in knee-deep water in the middle of nowhere. And your father would be like, I'd be right back. I'm going to run and get some snacks. You guys need anything. And, you know, you just leave the kids <laughs> And then you come back in, and we would have a ball out in the middle of the ocean on a sand dunes when the tide went out. And um, there would be nobody around. And we would he would come back. We'd have clams. We'd have crab. We'd have fish. We'd have everything. Some we threw back. Some they cooked. Um, but that was the earliest I remember was that. And then as I got older, we did a lot of lake fishing. Um, up, upstate New York, where my father is, we would be, you know, in the, a lot of the ponds. And a lot of lakes up there, big bass fish in the farm ponds, and um, more lakes than rivers. I didn't fish too many rivers until I got older. That's really interesting, and I know from doing my research for the interview that um, you started tying flies before you started fly fishing. So, how did you get into fly tying? Um, I got I got tired of uh, spending money buying fishing lures, and so I was just going to make them. And not that that's any cheaper, and it's definitely not cheaper now when you're buying <laughs> flies. But it, uh, I went online and I was said, you know, let me see how some of these guys are painting these balsa wood poppers, and I'll see if I can find something. And I found a video of somebody spinning deer hair. And I don't know who it was, and I can't remember, but I couldn't stop watching it. And I went out and I bought a fly tying kit, and it, I burned through all the material in an afternoon. And then I just went looking for more and more books and more materials. I go to the dollar store. I go to my sewing bench. I get thread and just anything I could find to tie with, really. <laughs> and I didn't care that I didn't have what matched in the books I had. I just tied everything as best as I could with whatever I had. So as you got deeper and deeper into fly fishing, Nicole, who were some of the people that influenced you? Uh, well, the biggest the biggest thing was the being influenced with the fly tying or anything that you're interested in doing is when it comes to the first couple people that you meet in regards to what happens later on. You know, if you decide you like something and you want to do it and you meet people that have no interest in speaking to you or have no interest in answering questions, it's not really going to get you too excited to continue it. So the first people I met were uh, Dave Brandt, uh, Pat Cohen, and Bruce Corwin, and they were tying flies at one of the smaller shows and 
it was nice because you could, you know, you could hear everything. You could see what they were doing. They were tying shifts. And now that I'm thinking about it, I don't even know if it was the same show or if it was two different shows. But those are the three people I remember that listened to like 5,000 ridiculous questions and all my notebooks and all the just, just, I couldn't stop talking because I had so many questions. Even now with everything else I do, I have notebooks on top of notebooks. Um, just at the end of a day or at the end of a shift or even now in the ambulance, like I have a call and I get off the ambulance and I'm like, you know what, let me write this down and then I'll do some research or I'll ask someone else or ask paramedics, you know, and I'll take notes. And it's the same thing with the fly tying and everything else. It's just you, your brain never stops. And when you meet other people whose brains never stop, there's just so much information exchange. <laughs> it just, it doesn't end. And if you were to meet, you know, say three people that didn't care to discuss anything or just brush you off or made you feel stupid, you're really not going to continue doing something, which is why when I teach, I try to tell people, just ask your questions. Don't, don't skip them. Don't care if somebody is aggravated with, you know, your question, because maybe they're having a bad day. Just ask them and move on because somebody else may want to know something that they were afraid to ask at the same show or the same table that you're at. But yeah, those, those three were a big influence when I first started because they, they listened to me badger them with like the most, I can't even think of any of the questions now. I just remember how excited they were to like, everybody's <laughs> this excited to see what the heck's going on and just watching me just take notes over and over, like just notebook. I had a full notebook. I went home and I reread everything and I rewrote everything you know, why do you do this and how do you get the wings up like this? Because Dave was doing Catskill uh, dry flies and Pat was spinning deer hair and it was just, you know, and uh, Bruce was doing like more realistic stuff. So I kind of got a little bit of everything um, just to start off my mind <laughs> of questions. Yeah. I mean, that's great. I mean, those are three great people uh, for sure. And, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Dave over the years and, spent some time with him up at the casting school and I, he's a, an incredibly thoughtful and methodical tire. Um, I've always enjoyed spending time talking to him when he's tying at shows. Yeah. And the history too, there's a lot of history with it. So you can, you know, Dave will start talking about, um, you know, what material you use to tie this fly and then he'll go into why, why do you use it? Why did they use it? They use this because they didn't have this, you know, we don't, it's so much easier to get these materials now and, if you look at the flies that were tied all those years ago and compare them to what the pictures we take of what we have now, they're nothing like that. And they work, they work just fine. Like even I tell people all the time, I think I caught more fish <laughs> in my first year of fly fishing and tying because I was having fun and I still have fun now, but it was more, you know, I didn't look as close to what I'm doing. I didn't spend as much time, um, take, you know, looking close at what you're doing because you're taking photos of them, you know, for work or for step by step. But that's just me. That's not for the fish. That's just me and my little uh A D D, my O C D and I'm working up close. But, you know, in real life I'm tying flies and I'm throwing them in a the box and sometimes I look closely and sometimes I say, Forget it, my thread broke and I'm gonna fish with them just like this. Yeah. <laughs> so what was your what was your first vice? Um the first one was the one I had gotten in that kit, and then I broke it. Um, I broke it pretty quickly. And uh, then I tied in my hands for a little bit. <laughs> and uh, then I got, what did I get? See, my grandfather, when he found out I was I was fly fishing, he, you know, I, I, I hate to say I never fished with him. It was kind of like a high and by, you know, hey, we're going up, we're coming down, and going upstate, things like we didn't fish. So when he found out that I was fly fishing, he said, you know, come on up. I got some stuff for you. And he gave me a box of stuff. It was his old vice in there. And there was, um, I was fishing with, I started fishing with his gear when I first started. It was like an old multiplier reel that he used in Alaska, <laughs> his old bamboo eight weight. And I fished with that for a long time. Um, but I used whatever vice he had in there. And then I finally got a real vice and I started using a regal and I just, it made everything so much easier. The hooks don't fall out. Every time you're, you know, especially with the deer hair and you're pulling on it, you're not, you're not, you know, the hooks don't 
bend out of it. They don't fall out of it. And um, it was just an easier setup. So I don't have to find somewhere to clamp it all the time. And I did tie in my hands for a little while. And it, it, it wasn't as, I wouldn't want to do it all the time. But, you know, it's a learning experience. <laughs> Yeah, no. Plus, before they had vices, everyone tied in their hands. It was like the uh, thread. They didn't even have bobbin. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Is there a preferred style of flies that you like to tie? Um, whatever I can get done. <laughs> I have a list of different things. So sometimes I'll just tie a lot of soft tackles for one length of time, and then I'll say, you know, I want to work on dry flies, and I'll just tie a lot of dries. Um, the soft tackles they are still my favorites. <laughs> but definitely my favorite to tie and to fish. Um What what I drew think, yeah. what drew you to soft tackles? Uh, the material was cheaper at the time. <laughs> Instead of paying, you know, I, I didn't have the money for the dry fly necks that I had seen, so I bought whatever I could afford and what I could afford was the uh soft tackles and the hen necks and they just became so much fun to tie and you could, you know, and you could use the bigger feathers and you could, I don't want to say shrink them down, but you can manipulate the feathers to where you're using the entire, um, the entire neck, the entire everything on all of them. Use it for the throat, use it for the hackle itself, use it for tailing. So you were tying for a while and then you started fly fishing. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, how you were like, I've had enough tying. I need to go fish. Um, oh, well, the first time I ever actually fly fished, I took a, uh, I, I took all the flies I had and I went to my aunt's farm pond and I took, uh, whatever I had and I went out there and I, I told her, um, I'm going to take a few casts in the farm pond. And the first thing I did was, this was before I fished with my grandfather's old bamboo rod, um, which was definitely made a little better than what I had purchased the first time. So I went to a store and I bought like a kit, you know, just a, a cheap, I don't even know. I'm sure it had a name. I can't think of it now. It was just whatever, whatever was on sale. It was the rod, the reel. I put it together. I figured out as best I could. I went to my aunt's house and said, I'm going to take a cast. I took two steps <laughs> towards the edge of the farm pond. I fell in the pond. And when I went to turn around, I <laughs> I slammed the rod on the side of the fence and I broke his hand. I made a fish with it. The first thing I did was just fall in, spin around, break the rod. That was that was the first time I ever fly fish. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so I did bring it back to the store and they gave me a new one. And then I went out and I did a lot of lake fishing. <laughs> Not near the fence, though, or the edge of that pond. But I did go back to that pond and catch a couple big ones. Um, but then uh, it was a lot of lake fishing. I didn't do too much trout fishing until later on. And it was ponds and bass, bluegills, anything, just warm water. And then I needed something in between the winter and summer. And I found the trout fishing and I couldn't stop once I started because it was like just so much information because now you're going from fishing streamers and things that I would take my older palas and lay them out and then draw a picture or whatever I was doing and tie my streamers to match some of my favorite lures. So I would just take whatever material I could find and try to get it to look the same and swim the same. And I was fishing on the sink and line in the lakes. <clears throat> and then when trout fishing came along, I'm like, wow, I need like six kinds of one caddis in every stage, you know? <laughs> And it, to me, it became more involved and more to to think about, a lot more to think about. And I, my brain just doesn't can't sit, seem to sit still. So it was really interesting. And uh, then now it's now. <laughs> yeah, and, and so as you kind of worked into you know your, you know deeper and deeper into your fly fishing journey, who were some of the people that mentored you and influenced your development as an angler? Um. It's hard. It's hard to say because it's. I guess you would say a little bit of everyone because when I first um, started, I would go to every show I could find, every fly fishing show, every tying show, and I would just walk around and ask people questions. 
Or I would just sit there and stare like a weirdo, like watching my child. Like, what's that? What are you doing there? And then they'd be done. They're like, I don't have any questions. And I'm like, can you do it again? So I can, I want to watch, you know, and then I would spit out 10 or 15 questions. And it was like watching like a little kid at a carnival, just go from show to show and table to table and watch seminars. So it was, it's hard to say one person. It would be, I think, just everything in general. Because I don't know, I don't know how to word it. No, <laughs> no, no. How I mean, to word. No, it makes a lot of sense. One mentor. Yeah. I think it's kind of, because there's a lot of people that love to teach in the industry. And it, they're, they're so excited to teach other people. And it's the same way I teach. Like I get, just I, I was doing a demonstration over the weekend. Um, a free, like an introduction just to kick off some of the classes I was teaching. And it, it was great to just have even one person, you know, you can have a room of 50 people watching you do something. And if people are not that interested and they're looking at their phones or doing other things, that's okay. You know, people, they want to kind of get away from the noise and they want some place to sit. But if you can have 50 people watching you compared to three people watching your demonstration, all three of them have a hundred questions. I mean, where do you kind of feel like you're you're helping someone out? Like it's not so much how many people are in a room; it's how many people are interested in what's going on. So it was great because I had a few people that were just asking a hundred questions. I think there was probably I don't know, maybe there were like ten people there, and I did it last time to kick off the classes that I was going to be teaching. And um, it it is nice; it's the same way I enjoy teaching now. Is just ask the questions, all of them. <laughs> it doesn't matter. How ridiculous they sound! You can wait till I'm finished if you don't want anyone to hear you, and you know, and ask them then because not everyone's comfortable asking questions, you know, especially when they're beginning. No, absolutely. And wanted to ask you too: where are your where's your favorite place to fish? Mm, I have to say anywhere I can put my boat <laughs> on a lake, maybe <laughs> or any place that's not too crowded, but. Uh, I do. I I fish the Catskill pretty much in Europe, in the Adirondacks, or you know the Roscoe Links in the latter area up up through there. And um, it's nice. I miss I miss fishing up where my dad is. Um, and where I am now, it's it's still kind of you know it's, it's very dense woods, but it's not it's not kind of the same where you grew up fishing. So I don't know. It's I don't know if I have too many definitive answers there. <laughs> no, it's, I don't know. I mean, I have lots of different places. It's hard to, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to narrow it down, but I do, I do like fishing up, up in the Catskills, um, and the Adirondacks. Well, that's great. And, and kind of shifting gears a little bit, um, I wanted to talk about the quilted tire and I wanted to ask you where you came up with the idea for the website. Um, I have, I have, um, I don't know how to word it. There's, there's just so much information that a lot of us share and it's not just fly time. You know, you have people that, um, they're cooking, they're, they're taping. A lot of people I meet that tie flies, their wives do a lot of sewing. And it's crazy how many actually are, I don't want to say paired up like that, but how many married couples, like one does a lot of sewing one does a lot of time or they both do a lot of time, you know, but a lot of it is somewhere between. So I would meet someone and I'm talking to them about fishing and then, you know, I'm talking to their wife and then we're talking to the team and the guy's like, I'll give me that recipe for that, that campground, something I was making like a Dutch oven outside. And, um, so it's kind of a mix. It's kind of, a, I was trying to put everything into one spot between the books I read. Cause a lot of people were asking me for recommendations on, certain things and I was trying to put everything in one spot and it's a little it's a little behind right now I'm trying to get it um updated but I wanted to make it easier to use so if you're on the website and you go to a step-by-step and it says how to how to wrap this hackle you click this and then it'll take you to another one another link that opens up and gives you pictures right there so as you're looking through a step-by-step, you can click on one and it'll open to another page and explain to you how to do it if you don't know how to do it. You know, if you're new to it, and you say do a, a counter wrap, you click here, it opens up, and there's a separate page how to do it. And when you're finished, you can close it and go back to where you started. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, and as you mentioned, I mean, the quilted tire's got a lot of stuff on it in addition to fly fishing and fly tying. I mean, there's cooking information, there's sewing information, there's craft information. Where did the, where did those interests come from? Was it just something you kind of bumped into that was interesting to you meeting other fly fishers and fly tires, or was it something from your childhood that was really important to you? Well, I always was, I don't know how to say creating something, whether it was painting or drawing or um, just working with my hands. And I did a lot of arts and crafts with my aunt when I was younger. I had a lot of cooking with my mom. And between the two of them, I got a lot of different things done between artwork and she read a lot of books. And it's it stayed with me for a long time. Um and even now, it, it's still, like, I'm sitting on my desk now, and there's just paintbrushes everywhere. And as much as I didn't have more time as I wish I did, in the back of my head, I wish I had more time. <laughs> this is the way you'd word it, to do with the hundred things that you enjoy doing. Instead of doing them a little bit at a time, you spend more time in big chunks. You know, I'll do a lot of painting for a month. I'll do a lot of drawing for another month. And then I'll kind of mix it up and I have like 10 projects I'm working on at one time. I just can't seem to pick one that I like more than the other. So they're always going at one time. And on the website, and put a little bit of everything on there because, you know, everybody that I meet has a lot of common interests. You know, you, you share simple things like recipes or book recommendations. And you do it more often than you think, even if it's like taking a, a picture of something, a cover you're reading and you text it to your friend. And you don't even say anything to each other. And like a month later, like, oh, you know that book you, uh, you, you told me about? You know, it was pretty good. And <laughs> But I was trying to put everything that I enjoyed into one website because I met, you know, a lot of different people. Some of the, the, the guys that I tie flies with from their wives, I go to quilting clubs with. So we kind of mix it up in between. And then some of them, we all fish together. But there's, there seems to also be some sort of, what do you say? I don't know what the word is. Something between fishing, you know, fly tying and quilting that just seems to be hand in hand. And that's not what the quilted tire is, but it is, for me, I think it's pretty funny because I meet people at a quilting event. And they say, oh, my husband's fly fish or my, my daughter's fly fish. And then you go someplace and you go to a fly fishing show. And, you know, they tell me all about people that do a lot of fly fishing. And you meet different people on, on either end of it. So I know you're involved in a lot of not-for-profit activities. And when I did my research, Nicole, for this interview, it was really clear to me that giving back and supporting uh, your community – both those things were very important to you. And I was really interested to understand where that came from. Was it a childhood experience or something that happened to you later in life that really made you uh, value giving back in community? Uh, it's hard to say because it, it, I don't know if it comes from one single place or it just always seems like something I, I want to be doing at the time. You know, somebody needs help and I'm there to help them in, you know, whether it's, I'm trying to learn of the technique on a fly tying uh, technique or just just in general, like when I'm at work and just out in public. And it's not all the time. Like, you can't help the entire world. <laughs> you can't, you know, but it's, it's um, I don't know what it is. It just seems to happen. And it's I enjoy doing it. So when I can, I do do as much as I can, you know, at the time. Yeah. And I know too, for you, I mean, it, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, I know that it's not just your, you know, non-work life, it's all of your work life, right? So I know that you're a certified home uh, health aide and you help people with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And I know when we were setting up this interview, you told me you recently passed your certification to be an EMT. Uh, and you told me that you always wanted to be a paramedic. And I was really curious about what drew you to emergency medicine. Um, I've had an interest in it for quite a while, even when I was working in the hospitals. Um, but I never really had a chance to sit down and, you know, enroll in school, and get everything done from start to finish. So in between moving from one state to the next, as I went from one job to the next, it kind of happened. And I had been on the ambulance squad where I live for 
I don't know, maybe six months, maybe longer, and then they put me into school. And I finished up and I started doing that as well. And, you know, once you start one, you can't do 10 jobs at once. So I have jobs in one state and I had to stop doing something. And it kind of just happened to where I went from doing what I was doing to doing what I had been interested in doing as I kind of left from one place to the next. So it somehow worked itself out while I was in between moving my work from one state to the next. Really interesting. I think one of the neatest things that I, I've read that you do is that you're a medical tattooist and that you help breast and skin cancer survivors. And I, I was really interested to hear, you know, when and how you realized you could help people uh, in that way. Well, see, that's one of the jobs I've been trying to move from New York to New Jersey or closer into New York um, to where I am. And when I started doing it, it it was, I don't want to say it was an accident, but it wasn't planned. You know, it was, somebody had come into the tattoo shop and asked me if I could co- cover her abdominal scars. And she wanted to either cover them up with a skin tone or do it in anything. So I took a look and we decided that doing it in a skin tone because the scars were so big. They were almost as thick as a pencil. In some places it wouldn't do anything but make them stand out. So instead of doing skin tones and making them more noticeable, we took the scars and turned them into vines and flowers and did did it right across her, her abdomen. And she went and showed the people at her job, which was in the hospital and in the plastic surgery office. And they asked me to come in and take a look at the photos to see if I could do anything for scar coverage. And, but not, you know, not in a sense of flowers and vines, but more color matching and skin tones and just scar coverage in general to make things less noticeable. And I said, you, you know, we went over, cause that was probably the first time I saw the extent from the beginning to end of how a full surgery would go from before they found the cancer. uh, Well, before they did the surgery on the cancer through the full mastectomy to the reconstruction. And, you know, I've done work, I think at one point under like 10 different surgeons. So you're doing tattoos and you learn something. You could do 10 tattoos and somebody may say, oh, you're just doing 10 areolas but you're doing 10 different areolas on 10 different scars from 10 different surgeons they're never going to be the same and if you're doing a unilateral you have to match to the other side that's you know as best you can so you're always learning and it was when I first started you know I said can you you know come on in and show us what you know and that's what I did in the first (laughs) the first tattoo I did the woman that came in we were in the hospital itself and you know I, I told her I said a few people want to know if they can come in and take a look and I'll leave that totally up to you. It's not up to me. And she had, um, she said, yeah, sure. It's no problem. And next thing I know, I think total, we probably had seven, like 60 people just in and out, in and out. And I'm like, Oh my, and I just kept saying for it. I'm from working. And she's like, are you sure you're okay with this? <laughs> she's like, oh, it's no problem. They were, um, you know, they, they had students that came in some of the students, um, just to see what we were doing. And then I had the before pictures, the after pictures, they would come back for a touch up. And, um, I don't know how long ago I started doing that. 10 years, maybe longer. And I went from the hospital to a private practice and then the hospital merged with another practice. And then I took all my work into one office and all the surgeons would send me the patients from all their offices into one. And then from there, um, I finished up quite a few of the patients before I fully moved and then tried to, and I commuted for a while, I think up until, I'm trying to think how long ago, pretty recent, I was still commuting back and forth and then trying to move the work into this state. But I'm not sure where, I'm not sure when, and then somehow in between there, I started, you know, looking into what I had been you know, something else I had had an interest in. I mean, how many things can you have an interest in at one time? <laughs> but um, I still, you know, I, so I went to school while I was working, and then um, I finished up, and I'm still, even though I'm still doing the work as an EMT, I am 
still trying to move the practice over. Either if it's north, you know, northwestern New York or if it's in Jersey, I still haven't decided what to do. So, you know, it, it, things have a way of straightening themselves out when they're ready. You know, so I look into places, I look into offices, I look into hospitals, and then, you know, you 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 can't wait on something, so you move on as you as you work towards things, and then you see how everything works out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, you, you can't. You can't make a plan because life doesn't seem to like plans. It's just, yeah. you know, oh, you want to go out today in the sun? Here's some rain. You know, so you deal with it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Absolutely. Well, it's, you know, and I mean, I'm just amazed at all the stuff that you've done. And, you know, one of the things that, you, that uh, you've that you done is you co-founded the uh, Lafayette chapter of Kids on the Fly. And I'm really curious about where the idea for the program came from. Well, they have a program upstate um, New York. And they have another program in Randolph. And I had wanted to help out with the Randolph chapter, but my schedule wasn't really working. Um, so I had spoken to a few people about maybe starting one up, and I kind of thought about it and then said, you know, see what happens. And I was talking to a few people in the community about, we, I don't know, we had a lot of stuff going on that wasn't, like, the best, like, community-wise. And I said, you know, what do these kids have to do when, they have nothing to do. And they said, well, you know, they get out of school and they, they have activities, but, you know, they could always use one more. So I thought, you know, maybe we should start one up so these kids have something to do when they have nothing to do. It's like a better addiction or a better way to spend time. So I spoke to the guys that ran the other chapters, and then I spoke to uh, Robert Hopkins. He's um, a member of the Catskill Fly Tires Guild as well. And we were, you know, throwing ideas back and forth about where to do the program and we had a few different locations and nothing seemed to be available or to be where it would work, you know, because there's liability. What if a kid gets a hook in his finger and things like that. So he had um, spoken to Whitewater Flies in Lafayette, which is a fly shop down there. And he spoke to the owner, Greg, and Greg lets us do the program in his shop, which is great because, you know, it's local to the county. He has supplies there, so when you know we, if we're missing something, we get it off the shelves. We buy something. He's got there's a big field if the kids want to try casting at one of the open houses they have. And what's nice is the area that it's in. It's almost like a big family type shopping center, you know. So a lot of parents come and they tie with their kids, and a lot of parents actually come and they say, "You guys have fun. We're gonna do some shopping," you know, and which is great because the the place has like a little bit of everything. So if you want to stay, the shop has stuff to do. If you don't want to stay and the kids, you know, are old enough and they, they come by themselves. We have some kids that come constantly and they come every session and they get better and better. And they have a hundred questions. And it's nice to see them where they, what's the word? They're just, you know, they're addicted to it. And they, it's like a good addiction. It's not where they're doing something wrong. You know, or they feel like they shouldn't be doing it. It's, it's an answer. It's, well, it's not answer school because it's on Saturdays, but it's difficult because the kids go from sports and they go, they have so many activities as well. Sometimes I'm probably, I'm probably like a five year old myself, I guess, with all my activities. <laughs> but some of the kids come in and they're like, oh man, I gotta leave. I have to go to football. I have to go to this. And I want to stay in Thai Fly. So it's, we found a place where the kids can go, the parents can come. And it all works together, and it's nice that he lets us, you know, do the program in his shop because, you know, we're in there, we're making noise, we're doing, you know, and it's great for everyone because Greg comes and helps, and, and uh, you know, the kids like the place. You know, and it's interesting, Nicole, because, you know, one more thing you do is you're involved with the Catskill Fly Tires Guild, and how did that come about? I uh, I ran into the guild table at a show and they had, you know, a sign up sheet and there were a couple guys tying fly and they had the newsletters out on the table. And I picked they were free. You know, they would give them out to people as they came by. And I started reading them and there was just so much history in it and I couldn't you know, I couldn't stop looking at it because it wasn't just a fly pattern, it was where it came from. It was who supposedly invented it and how do they fish it and so I signed up, and I wasn't sure at the time what the guild was. I just, you know, if it was a fly tying club or if it was a something more, I don't know, formal, or if it was, you know, people just, just 
do a lot of teaching. So I signed up and I went to a few meetings. And for me, I thought it was pretty interesting because there were people with tie flies. You know, yes, it was meetings, it was business meetings as well. But for me, it was I would go for the information. You know, you meet new people, you you would be up at the Fly Fishing Museum in the Catskills, and you would be just just the area in general that I was fishing quite often. So I would go up and I would fish, and then I would go to the meeting and make like a weekend out of it and come back down. And after a while, I had been speaking to the previous secretary because I'm now the current secretary of the Fly Tires Guild, but I had been speaking to Judy and she had been telling me she was going to be stepping down and, you know, told me a little bit about what the secretary does, which in her words is everything. <laughs> and it is a lot, but, you know, now we have a whole new, what's the word, board in a sense. And everyone shares the responsibility. Some people, you know, the president comes up with new ideas for the meetings we have presentations we have we also oh now we actually have a kids program that was new and um bob or robert depending on how <laughs> what nickname we're using for him at the time he uh he loves to teach bob loves to teach and he me and him run the lafayette program and he offered to before the meetings to come in early with a few of us um more other members than myself because I try to make it up there earlier, but it doesn't always work out. So I help when I can because we have the other group as well. But so before the guild meeting, a few hours before at the Catskill Fly Fishing Museum in uh, in Livingston Manor, they get everything together. They have all the regals out, all the vices out, all the material out, and the kids come and they tie fly. So it's a free open fly time for the kids before the meeting. And, you know, not that the kids may want to stay for the meeting, but it's an introduction to fly tying itself. So the guild started that up, um, I think it was though, maybe sometime in the winter, maybe six months, I might be wrong, but it came up as just a small idea and then just went straight with it, which worked out really well because we were at the Fly Fishing Museum over last weekend or the weekend before, and we had for Summerfest and the guild had a fly tying table for the kids there and some of the guild members came up and they volunteered and the kids would come by and like hey you want to tie some flies and you know I'd show them how to tie and then Bob would show them and then um, they some of the kids had been there before from our program so they kind of follow the shows around with the parents which is pretty cool and um, so there's, there's a lot of new stuff going on which is nice because it's kind of getting back to what people I guess originally before I was a member, said they used to do a lot of, which was teaching and hanging out and tying flies. You know, so it's nice to get it back to what the members want to do with it. Because I don't know if it had lost touch after a while. I mean, maybe people don't want to hear that, but these, this is what I've heard. You know, they said that just want to get back to fun, which is what fly time should be. It should be fun. It should be hanging out and tying flies and teaching. If that's what you enjoy doing. Yeah, and you designed a coloring book for them too, didn't you? Uh, for the museum, yes. We had a, the, um, for the fly fishing museum, it was called, it's all about fly fishing. And Daddy Trout flies up in, he wasn't, he, those shops still in Roscoe, but they moved into Livingston Manor with a lar- with the real big shop now, which is, it's nice because everything's out. They, um, and the museum came up with, you know, the idea to put a coloring book together and they spoke to me about it and they said, what do you, you know, what do you, I, I had asked them, I said, how do you guys want it done? And they said, kind of just do whatever you want. And I was like, oh boy, <laughs> up to 8,000 ideas in my head. So I tried to do it where it was, like when I was younger, I loved coloring books, but I loved activity books, but I didn't want too much of one or the other. So the coloring book has a storyline through it. And as the kids read the story, it's about fishing, you know, with the with the grandpa over at the museum. And as the kids are going through the story, they're learning about the bug. They're learning about the, um, you know, the trout, different things. There's activities, you know, count the, count the bugs and put the, connect the dots. And you follow the story as you get to the end. <clears throat> so it kind of mixes everything in there together. And I'm actually working with, Daddy's shop uh, doing the fly time coloring book 
for the kids, which is going to be pretty interesting because I'm trying to get all these ideas down on paper and some sketches out and, and a few other things. That's uh, that's really cool. And, you know, it's funny, too, right? Because in your abundant free time, you became a published writer with Fly Tire Magazine. How did that come about? Uh, well, I had always been subscribing for about as long as I had been time flies. And I had gone on to renew my subscription and they had the link there where you can click to submit your article for, you know, to see if they'd be interested in it or something they want to to publish and you know I printed out the guidelines and I, I sat there and I read them over and I took a bunch of notes on how to do it and I started writing these just basic step by steps and then they did they actually sound kind of like robotic because like in, re, in real life I write the way I talk and it's all over the place so I sort of just just went and wrote a story about the, a fly that I had found in a tree on the beaver kill and I did a step by step for it and it was you know, it was it was just a story that happened, and it was pretty. A lot of people seemed to enjoy it, and actually, the best part I think about that one um, was how much feedback I got on how many other people, because the story was on the Renegade, the dry fly. But at the time, I didn't know if it was a dry fly or if it was. It could have been a soft tackle at the time um, because it was so old and, and falling apart. And I took it home. After I fished with it a couple times and I caught the fish and it, it got worse than it was. So I took it home and I took it apart and then I started to retie it. And I uh, wrote the article on the one I found and the way I think it was, you know, which, which one it was. But I got so many emails and so many comments, probably from like 20 or 30 people telling me about that specific fly. Well, and to think of how many you know, how many flies are out there? How many people told me these crazy stories about the same exact fly that had some crazy story attached to it or the first time they found it or the first time they fished it? A lot of people said, you know, I didn't know anything about it either and I just stumbled upon it and it was one of the best fishing days I had in a long time. And I have I had all these, these emails and comments of these stories and it was nice to see all the feedback because you, you wouldn't think you'd get that kind of feedback over for me anyway I just thought it would be you know an interesting story to put out there but that one fly seemed to have a lot of um what's the word a lot of yeah, it really resonated with that. yeah it resonated with yeah, people with a lot of people yeah and it was it was nice to hear everybody else's stories as well yeah, that's that's super cool, and I remember reading that article. I think that's probably the first thing that you wrote that I read. Um, that's super interesting, and you know, one of the things too that you know from doing my research and from talking to you tonight, it's really clear that you're a lifelong learner. And I'm was kind of curious about where your curiosity and your love of books came from. Oh my god, that I can I I love books, <laughs> lots of books. When I was younger, my mom used to be like. She would take it to the library all the time, all the time. And that's one thing I will never forget. And it's nice now because my nieces, they go to the library. They can't stop. They read all the time. And when I was younger, we would try to, I would try to take like as many books possible. My mom always said, you can only bring home as many books as you can carry. Because if it was up to me, I would just live there. And then at one point, I guess I found out that like, if I brought a basket or a wagon to the library, I'd <laughs> get more books home. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, if I could just, some days it's hard. Some days you're so busy. You read like, you know, two or three sentences and you can't focus. And then other days I'll sit there and I'll, I'll burn through a two or three hundred page book in a couple hours yeah. from start to finish. And you can't stop. And then you you put the book down and you're like, what the heck just happened to my day? Yeah. And you almost feel guilty because you feel like you didn't do anything. But sometimes you need that because I don't watch television. Like, we don't have TV. We don't have cable. You know, you watch a Netflix movie maybe, but that's really it. Like, I never enjoyed television when I was younger. That's that's really interesting, and it reminds me of um, – so when I was little, my mom uh, was a school teacher. And so we used to have a tradition in our family. I went to the library a lot too, but I can remember um, she always got paid at the beginning of the month and we would always go to the local bookshop and pick out a book. 
Um, and I, that, yeah. and that was, you know, I love books too. I probably have 10 books for every book I'll ever read in my entire life here in my, my office at the house. Yeah. I could probably build a house out of books just to put the books in. <laughs> yeah. So between that and finding some wall, more wall space to hang up some fly fishing, uh, pictures and photographs and prints, that's probably what I need to do. But, you know, I'm, a, I'm amazed. I was amazed when I, you know, was reading your articles and talking to you, you're insanely busy. And I, I'm really interested to hear about where your energy comes from and how you juggle all of your commitments. I used to think it came from coffee and I'm beginning to wonder if it's not true because <laughs> I seem to have way too much energy before I even drink coffee. I don't even have it anymore until the afternoon now because I get too much, like too much, uh, too much energy. Um, I don't know. I could never, as long as I can remember, sit still and I can sit still when it's needed, you know, like to think that all of us that can't sit still go fishing for 12 hours at a time and you're listening to nothing and you're not talking, you're not doing anything, man. You spend all this time. I don't even want to say thinking because you're not doing that either. So the fishing is kind of a break from the hundred other things that are going on at any given time. Um, Cause even now I'm sitting on my desk and I'm looking at, I have bulletin board, not bulletin boards. I have different sections where I have, all of my notes on um, every different thing. This is for the guild. This is for the kids program. I have a kids program in Ridgewood that um, I started teaching for sixth to eighth graders. And we have a one-on-one and we have a two-on-one and I have a guide license in New York state. So I have a women's fly fishing weekend. I teach up in the Adirondacks and a few other programs um, that we're working on. And, you know, I have the step-by-steps for steady trout flies that I'm doing for Joe stuff. And I don't know, it's just, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at this list and I'm like, where does it, <laughs> where's the, the free time? And then you think about it, that, that kind of is your free time because you're, you're, you know, you're enjoying everything you're doing. And my husband fishes, so me and him go fishing. We'll go for a weekend. We'll go, you know, we'll just play hooky in the middle of the week. <laughs> Nobody's around. And, you know, we both tie flies. We both fish. We both hunt. We both do all the same stuff. So it's, kind of like you're you know you marry your your best friend as they say and you just keep doing all the stuff you do now you buy a house full of fishing stuff full of everything else so everything is kind of all mixed in into one and so i don't know where i don't know where i find the time and the energy i don't know it's just it's there it's always there and the teaching i get wired to teach like i'm like you would think like I had six cups of coffee because I like to see other people interested in something that they had so much trouble with um, or that they, they thought, you know, hey, I wanted to start this, but I don't know how. And I tell them all the same thing. Start with the basics. Just you don't have to know the names of every fly. You just got to know what in your box looks. I do this with the kids, too. What looks close enough? I have them in their six-week program. I take them out. I'll do one day. I'm like, come on, let's, we're going to go out. I said, I want you to get all the bugs you can find that you get anything on this river or on the stream that you think a trout would eat. I don't care how ridiculous you think it is. Just grab it and throw it in the, in the big, uh, the big tub. And I have them take those back to the table. I put everything in there that looks, um, like something, you know, that we can put in a little vial and I show it to them. I explain to them what everything is. Then I pull all my fly boxes out and I have all the kids. I'm like, now I want you to look in my fly boxes and they're a mess. Oh, they're always a mess. <laughs> I said, I want you to find whatever you think looks the closest to what you found. And in my fly box, what you think looks just like that. And I'll have them match them up and then I'll go through everything they picked and I'll take whatever it was that they thought was the closest. And that's what we're going to tie the next day. And then after that, that's what we're going to fish with the next day. So the kids go from, they learn some casting, they learn some, um, you know, tying knots. They learn the basics of the river. They learn <clears throat> a lot of these things. And going through Parks and Rec in Bridgewood, New Jersey, <clears throat> they they kind of go from beginning to end. But it's all, I don't want to say mingled together where it starts from one end and finishes in the other. They're not learning about flies they're going to tie that they're never going to fish with. They're not learning about bugs that don't hatch around here. 
everything is together to where these kids came with 100 questions and now they found bugs, they tied those flies, they fished with those flies, and they caught fish with those flies. That's that's super cool. And um, as we're sort of winding down tonight, can you share with us some projects that you're working on right now? Um, organizing? <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life? Um, yeah, I'm actually, now that, that things kind of did settle down on my end, like in, in reality, I've been trying to get back to fill my fly boxes and getting back to the step by step. I have uh, I have a few articles I've been working on just just in general. I'm not sure if I'm going to finish them or if I'm going to start all over again, but I have a few articles. Um, I have some women's fly fishing and fly tying programs that I was asked to to teach and to put together. So there's some of those that I hate to say, I don't know the locations or the dates right now because they all came at one time. Um, but there's a few of those that are getting worked on at this time. And then we got the, the kids calling book. We got a, a lot of paintings that are finishing up and just different things. That I don't even know exactly how to word them. There's, you know how, you know how it is. Sometimes nothing's going on and then everything's going on yep. and you don't know, <laughs> where it's tough to start. So I think that's kind of where I am right now. It went from, I went straight through school, you know, full time. Um, and then just everything it seemed to have held off until I finished school, not intentionally interesting to work out like that. And now we have just a lot of different things going on, but there's a lot of classes, a lot of, um, programs, a lot of weekends to put together. And, and it, it's all, taught the same way no matter who I'm teaching men women children beginners and it, it, you just have fun it's not you know you don't don't ask the questions you know and ask them and don't care what anyone thinks because what does it matter you know so I teach everything the same way you know you come with the questions and you have fun and you just start from the beginning you know start with the basics and you go from there you know you, you found a brown book throw it in the fly box pull out a brown fly, fish it, see what happens. Because you'd be surprised when you're out there and you're goofing off and you're laughing, you know, you maybe you scare some of the fish, maybe you don't. <laughs> That's not the point. Now, the point is that you're enjoying what you're doing because once you, once you start to get, you know, to the point that you think too much or you worry too much about it and you don't have fun anymore and then you don't want to do it. So you kind of just, you, you kind of stop doing what you you know, yeah, you no. stop doing what you like doing. You, you know what I mean? No, it makes a lot of, makes a lot of sense. And I know you've got a lot of stuff moving around right now, but do you have, um, any like upcoming presentations or tying demonstrations you're doing that you can share with us? Um, I'm going to be up in, I think it's in, at the fireman's field in Hancock. They're doing spay days. I'm going to be tying flies there. Um, that is August 17th. And then I have a few fly time classes that are coming up I'm still working on. We have the kids program is in the free one is in Lafayette. It's in the first Saturday of the month. Usually every month we kind of move it around. So the best way to get the information is through the website um, or the email address or the Facebook. It's kids on the fly, Northwest New Jersey. And there's a few other ones. So if you look one up, you can find Randolph because they have their day different than us. So the kids can go to more than one program. They can come to ours and type flight and a week or two later go to go down to Steve's program and type flight. And, and I have Camp Sagamore in September. There's a women's fly fishing weekend I'm teaching, a beginner's course. That's going to be on the 20th, 21st, and the 22nd, I believe, up at the Great Camp Sagamore, up by Racket Lake in the Adirondacks. Well, that's great. Yeah, if you'll send that stuff to me, I'll drop them in the show notes for sure. And before I let you go, uh, why don't you let folks know where they can find you on the Internet? I have the, well, the website um, is thequiltedtire.com. The Facebook is the Quilted Tire. <laughs> Instagram is the same as the Quilted Tire. Perfect. Um, Yep, There's and I'll, an email address on there and anything else I think is in the contact information. Yeah, and I'll drop all that stuff in the show notes. And 
Uh, Nicole, I really appreciate you spending some time with me this evening. It's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed getting to know you better. And uh, before we go, I want to give a shout out again to uh, tonight's sponsor, the Virginia Fly Fishing and Wine Festival. Folks, go to the website uh, at vaflyfishingfestival.org and get all the information for that upcoming event in January of 2020. Great event put on by Bo Beasley. And folks, I really appreciate you listening. It'd be great if you would give us a review in iTunes and subscribe in the podcatcher of your choice. Again, Nicole, it's been a ton of fun. I really appreciate it. Tight lines, everybody. Tight lines, Nicole. Oh, thank you very much.